We're strong women. We know what we want. And when it comes to negotiations, uh, maybe not quite as much sometimes. If this sounds familiar, buckle up. Today's guest has more than three decades of global C-suite experience, and she's going to school us on how to up our game in negotiations. The climb to the top feels so good when you get there. Is it just us or can it feel lonely sometimes, even when you're successful? And who defines success anyway? What about life's twists and turns? We've learned a few things along the way and we're ditching the culture of competitiveness. Bringing together women from different backgrounds to share their stories. Let's do this together. Welcome to Think Tank of Three podcast. Welcome to the show. I'm Julie Holton here with Rishia Candidate Capasaurus and Audrea Fink. We are your think tank of three. And today we are welcoming an incredible guest to the podcast to share not just her story, but also the art of negotiations. Ladies, this topic comes up almost exhaustively for us on this podcast. It does. It really does. We talk a lot about it. I think because women tend to be less comfortable with negotiation. It's not a skill that society places any emphasis on women learning. So you learn it, if you're lucky, in business. I've done a lot of negotiation in previous roles, contract negotiations, vendor negotiations, discussing promotions, but even I'm still uncomfortable with it. And as I'm working on my own skills, with job offers and new opportunities, it's still something I'm uncomfortable with. Women also studies show tend to not put themselves out there for the opportunities like new jobs or promotions, unless they are 100% sure that they are qualified or even over qualified. Our guest has some thoughts on that and ways for women to really change their mindset on negotiations. Julie Fesson Holder retired from the Dow Chemical Company, where she was a senior VP running multi-billion dollar business portfolios, a true trailblazing executive who now funnels all of that C-suite experience into helping women like us shape our careers. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Julie. I'm delighted to be here. We are so glad to have you. So I want to start first with your own personal path to the C-suite. What did that look like? Tell us, how did you move up the ladder? Well, I graduated from the great Michigan State University and started my career in sales. And unlike many people today, I had a career with one company, which was Dow, and I was there for 35 years. I did a fairly typical sales career, sales, marketing, sales management, marketing management. And then I was given the opportunity to run a $30 million business and then three $30 million businesses and portfolios of businesses until in 2000, I was asked to run a portfolio, a billion dollar portfolio of industrial chemical businesses. And then I moved over to our plastics business and ran a similar portfolio of businesses, doubled the size. And then the last three years of my career, I was fortunate enough to work for our CEO and I ran marketing and sales, the function, and I ran public affairs and government affairs. And I also ran human resources for a time for the company. Wow. Moving up the ladder, (laughs) just kept it going and kept it going. So now you transitioned out of corporate America. You chose to launch your own business after having such great success moving up that ladder at Dow with JFH Insights. Why are you so passionate when it comes to helping women in their careers? Well, as you would imagine, when I started my career, there weren't a lot of women in the workforce and in almost every role. Probably even less in sales. Yes. And in an industrial chemical company, you know, in a manufacturing industry as well. And I was not a chemist. I was a business major. So I came at it from a different skill set than many of my peers as well. But because I was the first or only woman in almost every role I had and As I progressed through my career, the company started hiring more women, but we weren't very good at keeping the women that we hired. And I saw a lot of talent walk out the door. I always felt that that was a real loss for the company because, you know, we needed to build a diverse and inclusive environment. I thought my skill set being different from my male peers skill set was a strength for me, not a weakness. And the company benefited from that and they gave me new opportunities. So I always wanted to help the company be more successful with women, and I always wanted to help women be more successful as well. And so when I retired, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew I was passionate about helping women. 
I met another woman who was similar to me in her views and we started working together and we approached Michigan State University and launched an executive ed program for women, mid-career professional women that we ran for 11 years. And now I'm working with a couple other universities in teaching segments for them in their executive women course. And I also do some one-on-one coaching of executive women. And then I've also done kind of my nonprofit interest around women too, helping women who are victims of sexual assault and domestic abuse. I've invested in women through some angel funds. And I just think that, you know, women have not had the opportunity that they deserve and that companies, our country, our politics would be so much better if we had more women leaders. We're wasting a lot of talent by not being more successful at moving women into positions of leadership. Preach. Preach. (laughs) So true. (laughs) It's very true. When you think about the fact that women make up half of the world, but not half of the boardroom, it makes you wonder what is missing from that boardroom. When you say women don't necessarily get the same opportunities, they also don't get the same training. They don't have the same expectations placed upon them for work. I know that myself in sales, when I joined the sales industry, if you will, or sales market, there were women and it was amazing. And I had really wonderful women mentors, but it wasn't as common as having the men in the workplace. One of the skills that I think women need help with because they're not really encouraged to go down this route is negotiation. We talk a lot about it on our show. We talk about negotiating for pay, negotiating for promotion, just negotiating in general. Women, more so than men, tend to be less comfortable with it. What are some of the skill sets needed to be a strong negotiator? One of the reasons women don't negotiate on behalf of themselves is not because they're not good negotiators, because Women negotiate for their children. Women negotiate health care for their family. I mean, think about, you know, if your child is sick and you want to get into a doctor, women are great negotiators. Women in companies in purchasing positions, we're great negotiators on behalf of our company, on behalf of our family, but we're not great negotiators on behalf of ourselves. And I think one of the reasons for that is because we don't understand how men negotiate differently than us. And one of the things that I discovered as I developed this curriculum for executive leadership for women is the differences in how men and women approach things in the workplace really opens eyes for women. And once they realize how the guy down the hall is playing it, they get more courage to play it similarly. Now, Women have to be good at negotiating, not just negotiate. And that's another reason women don't negotiate for themselves is sometimes they get punished for negotiating for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they're viewed as too brazen or too assertive. And so not only do we have to have these skills, we have to do them well, whereas our male counterparts don't usually get penalized for not doing them well like we do. So I think that doing your homework, you always need to approach negotiations in a company speaking in the language of benefit for the company. I have a lot to offer. I've delivered this, this, and this. Consequently, I'd like the opportunity to grow and think that you know this would be an appropriate reward for you know what I've delivered for you. So it's important that we do our homework and think about how to negotiate. But we also, I think, get courage when we understand kind of what the language of the workplace is. And actually, research shows that a lot of women leave companies because they get passed over for a promotion or they don't get a salary increase. And the way they discover it is, you know, when one of their male peers gets that promotion. And as they're walking out the door, they go into their boss's office. He will, he or she will say to the woman, I didn't know you wanted it, you know, or I didn't know that was important to you. You know, we also need to speak up on behalf of ourselves and make sure that what we want is known. If we don't negotiate for ourselves, no one's going to negotiate for us. I was just having a conversation the other day with a man and we were talking about kind of different approaches in business with, with employees. And he's in a position where he has a role in hiring and firing and negotiating the company's 
the salaries for the company's employees. And of course, as an agency owner, I'm in charge of that for my agency. And we were talking about, you know, two women on my team who both do an incredible job and always wanting to make sure that, that I'm valuing the people on my team and I'm not showing them value if they're doing the same job at different pay rates. And so I was actually having this conversation with him about, you know, me getting into this process of offering one of the women, you know, an increased pay rate without her asking me for it, because that's just what, for me as a person, that's just what I feel is the right thing to do. And it was so interesting even to hear his take on that and how that's bad for business. And why would I give someone a promotion if they haven't asked for it or a pay increase if they haven't asked for it? And I thought, wow, our brains think totally differently on this topic. I mean, what do you think? Is that something that even fundamentally is different sometimes between women and men? Absolutely. I think that's a great story and a great illustration of how differently we think. Because, you know, if you think about it, companies aren't inclined to give you any more than you ask for. And frankly, they kind of want to pay you as little as they can. These large companies typically have structures, you know, an annual performance evaluation and an, and an annual salary increase based on performance. But a lot of people aren't in those situations, they're in small companies. And, you know, they don't have processes and systems to kind of help them. A business owner may say, I've got to keep my wages low, whereas the employee, of course, wants to make what they're worth. Which brings up another point is we really need to test the market to know what we're worth. And I think a lot of that is what's happening today with people leaving the workforce or people looking for other roles is this pandemic has offered us the opportunity to kind of look at work in a different way. But you do need to test kind of what you're worth outside, if particularly if you don't think you're getting paid well where you are. And the other thing I often tell women, particularly women in companies that have these processes and structures, is your HR representative is your best friend if you have a relationship with them, you know, because you do need people inside because that's another taboo typically is we don't talk about our salaries and companies don't want you to talk about your salary. Right. So it's in their best interest, not in ours. And if you can find people to share information with, so you get a feel for if you're being treated fairly or not, or you can use the outside market to get a view for what you should be paid. And you definitely need to keep track of your own performance and your deliverables and be able to articulate those as a way to say, you're not giving me a gift. This isn't pay for lack of performance. I am delivering for you. And consequently, I am worth this amount, this opportunity, this pay, whatever it might be. I think women, we just really need to rewire our minds. We really need to rethink our worth. Julie was telling her story and I was thinking former NBA college coach, Larry Brown, who was, he'd get a job and then it was almost like he was negotiating for his next job after being a year in the one he just got. And it's like, he's always looking for the next gig. But as women, we get into our spot and we're like, okay, you know what? We're, we're in a good place. I don't want to rock the boat, even though you know full well, but I should be getting what John Jackson in Cubicle 2 is getting. I'm doing the exact same thing. And it tends to come back to that question of, you never ask. Listen, I like my TV shows and my movies and quotes, but there was an episode on Grey's Anatomy where Meredith Grey got the general surgery gig, but she was offered Amazing. one thing and everybody kept asking, wow, that's it. And she's, she realized something was up <laughs> and Miranda Bailey said, <laughs> someone asked, why aren't you offering? She said, because it's not my job to offer her. She needs yeah. to understand what she's worth. She needs to ask. That was her taking the male point of view. Whereas what Julie was saying was, why should she have to ask? I know what she's worth. I'm going to give it, but we need to get into that habit of don't just assume that they, they do recognize, but if you're not going to ask what, why do I have to offer you more if you're not going to ask me about it? And small disclaimer here. I also know that keeping my employees is really important because I want them to stay working for my company. <laughs> yes. Julie's a good person. She wants to, you know, make sure someone's getting what they're worth, but also it makes my company better to have people that are getting paid and that I'm showing them the value of the work that they're providing. 
One of the things I often tell women is when you get a salary increase from your boss, you know, it's fine to say thank you. But my response as a manager was always to that individual. This isn't a gift. You earned this. And this is a recognition of your performance. And that's why you're getting this bonus or retention or, you know, salary increase or promotion. So I think we as women may tend to think of, you know, you gave me a raise, you gave me a promotion. Well, no, we earned that promotion. And the guy down the hall knows he earned that promotion. And so you have to approach it like you earned that promotion too, because you did. We had a guest, Dana, on our podcast before talking about negotiating for your salary. And one of the things she said that you've echoed so far here is you have to go and approach with the language of business. A lot of times we treat everything around us in a sort of relationship manner because we do build relationships because we are empathetic and communicative and we build our tribes everywhere we go. We think of this business as part of our tribe. It's part of our identity. And so when we get to the part where we're talking about promotions, I think a lot of times, I will speak for me, in my previous job, I had a wonderful relationship with my manager. She was phenomenal. She was an advocate for me. She was a sponsor for me. So when I would go to her for my promotion, I went as this person is on my tribe. They're on my team. She's still operating though within a business and a business doesn't care. It's not a living thing. It's not something you can have a relationship with. The business wants to spend as little money as possible and make as much money as possible. It's not personal. She will give me what I demand or I will walk and she will know this. It's not really a relationship. It's a job. We had a guest, Allison Tibnon, talking about mm-hmm. that. And she was negotiating for years down the road, not even necessarily for within that year. Think about a partnership in two to three years. And they were fearful that they were going to lose her when they go to have this lunch. And then when they realized, no, 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 she's happy. Then they really showed their hand when she was like, now that you, we know that you're really, really happy and you were fearful that I was going to go, this is what I need you to think about if you want me to stay. Going into that room, speak Speaking the language that those people in that room are going to understand, because generally speaking, those people in that room are men and they really do just speak a completely different language than we do, which isn't bad, but it's better if you at least, if you know that language and understand that language and you can shift into that and make it work for yourself. I think it's good that we have a different mindset of things, but we just have to be able to go into their world and show them where they're thinking wrong. (laughs) (laughs) And we have to survive in their world. You know, if we're going to, and we want to flourish in their world. And frankly, the business world is still a man's world. Julie, I imagine that in this man's world, you had a lot of tough negotiations or situations where you had to persuasively make your case for things throughout your career. Is there a time when you were met with a particular challenge that would be helpful for us to learn from? What kinds of situations did you encounter that you thought, okay, this is going to be a tough one? One of the most, I think, interesting things that happened to me in my career was when I had my first child. And I had been with the company for 13 years and I had done well, but I was really at a crossroads as many women are. Can I continue to be successful and move up? Do I need to step aside and move into a staff role? Because I had been in line roles my entire career and I was really struggling with that. And my boss at the time said, go out and talk to different managers in the company and get their perspective. So one half of the company's managers, and this was, I would say, the more hierarchical part of the company said, nope, you can't compete with the guys. My issue was travel because in sales and marketing, you travel a fair amount. And I was willing to travel, but not 50, 70% of the time. I wanted to limit my travel to about 30%. And one group of the company's managers said, nope, can't be successful competing against the men. They'll do whatever it takes. And you putting limitations on yourself will not make you successful. That was the last group of managers that I had listened to. And so I was going to take a lateral move. I was due for a promotion. I was kind of ready to move up. I was excited about that new role, but I had those tapes in my head. And so I was going to take a lateral move into a staff function. And as I was walking down the hall to accept this role, 
a top leader in another part of the company pulled me into his office and said, I know you've been making the rounds. Would you decide? So I told him what I'd heard and he raised his eyebrows. And I said to him, I take it you don't agree with the advice I've been given. And he said, no, I don't. He said, frankly, I think the men travel because they like to travel, um, not because they need to travel, because it's easy to leave home on a Sunday night when you have three young children and two of them have colds and you can get on an airplane and go to a fancy dinner. And he said, we need women in this role. There had maybe been one or maybe two in the company at that point. And I think you can manage your travel and I'm going to have a job open in a couple of weeks. You're my candidate. It's going to be a promotion for you. And I'd really like you to think about taking it. And I walked out of his office. I still get goosebumps when I think about this because I felt like this millstone had been lifted off my neck. It was what I wanted to do and what I thought I could do, but no one had told me I could do it. But the other thing that was a a bit frightening or serendipitous about it is had I not ran into him at that moment, walking down the hall to accept this job, my career would have been completely different. So I think there are a number of lessons to learn from that. One is you need men to help you and to guide you and to give you good career advice. You need men to be sponsors for you to help pull you along. But you also need to realize that sometimes it's a two minute conversation that you either have or you don't have that can change your career. And you need to make sure you kind of seek out different perspectives before you make big decisions, because having a different boss could make all the difference in the world in terms of how successful you're going to be. And I would also say, listen to your gut. I always tell women, listen to your gut, because I do think your gut often kind of gives you a good feel of, are you on the right track or are you on the wrong track? Do you need to make a change or is this okay? I love the idea of listening to your gut because I think, as you mentioned, we have these tapes that play in our head. This is what I'm capable of. This is where my limit is. For whatever reasons, those those are the, the restrictions we put on ourselves. You know what you're capable of. I have looked at roles where I thought, oh, I'm way underqualified for that. And then talk to somebody else who said, you're not underqualified for that. Why do you think that? Oh, well, because I don't have this one particular piece of experience. And it's so silly how we trap ourselves in these stories. And it very frequently takes a mentor or a sponsor or an ally to turn those tapes off. One of the things you mentioned that I want to circle back to, because I think it is so important, is this idea of mentorship and sponsorship. Women tend to get mentorship frequently. It's very common for a woman to go after a mentor to spend that time talking and working through their careers. And I think they're mentorship is wonderful. The thing women don't tend to do as often is get sponsors and sponsorship is very common for men in business, not as common for women. We don't know how to go after it. We don't know necessarily how to ask for it, what it looks like. Talk to us about how we can negotiate to get sponsors instead of mentors. You know, one of the things I've discovered recently is a lot of men don't know what the difference between mentorship and sponsorship is, which (laughs) It is kind of crazy. <laughs> that explains because, why they go after it. <laughs> yeah. You know, because sponsorship has been going on in corporate America for, you know, ever. I mean, we hire people who are like us. We promote people who are like us. We bring people up the ranks like us. And that's often the way things worked. And women enter the workforce, we're different. We're not like them. So, and you're right, women do get over-mentored and under-sponsored. And so how do we get sponsored? Because the challenge is that you don't choose a sponsor, sponsor chooses, choose you. So you have to cultivate that relationship with someone who's going to pull you up, which means a sponsor has to be higher level than you, has to be someone who can pull you up through your career and someone who will speak for you when you're not in the room. So there's an opportunity here. You know, I think Adria would be great for it. Let's put her on the candidate list. Let's interview her for the role. And men need to realize that they need to sponsor women as well as men. So companies have a role in getting people to understand the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Many large companies now are putting together programs that educate people on sponsorship so that the leaders know what it is and you know what they're doing when they're doing it, because they've been doing it, they may just not know. But for women, it's harder to pick a sponsor. But I think certainly if there's a leader, you've impressed. So I would say 
pick a leader a couple levels above you and get to know them. You know, it's probably your boss's boss, or maybe it's someone who reaches a hand out to you to find out about your career and then cultivate that relationship, making sure that they know what you're delivering for the company so that they speak highly of you. You know, you want them to represent you or they want to hire you. You know, I often talk about how your brand is like a a company brand. You want to move from getting hired to being selected to being loyal and to being indispensable. I want to hire Julie because she's the best person for my team and she will really bring something to it. So how do you cultivate that relationship so that that leader wants to bring you along with them. And so networking becomes a really important part of your career as well and helping them get to know how good you are. So if you have someone who is either new to the workforce, new to the area, they're brand new at a company, and they don't necessarily have easy access to that two to three level sponsor, how do you recommend they either go about building their brand or networking so that they can rub elbows with the right people? Well, I think first off, you do the job that you're hired to do very well. So let's say, you know, that's table stakes, obviously. And then you either find an opportunity through, you know, we're having a dinner and you avail yourself of that, or you go to a presentation perhaps that the senior leader gave, and then maybe you run into them in the hallway and you have an opportunity to say something like, what really struck me was this, this, and this. We talk a lot about an elevator speech, which I think is really important for women as well, because often our interactions with senior leaders are in line in the cafeteria, in a meeting, walking in or walking out. And one of the things I tell women is they have to get out of their language. Oh, everything's going fine. And I'm working very hard because, you know, when you run into somebody, a senior leader and they say, Hey, Julie, how are you? And you're like, Oh, things are really great. And I'm working very hard. Here's a missed opportunity when you could say, and maybe twice that long, but not much longer is I'm really excited. My team just delivered on the most important goal for the year. We saved the company $50 million on a purchase. And I think we could really leverage this across the organization. Now, how long did that take? Not long at all, but It gave them an opportunity to go, oh, wow, that's pretty darn impressive. I'd like to hear more. And it gives you an opportunity to then say, I'd love to share with you how we did it. Could I get on your calendar for a cup of coffee? So that's how you do it. I mean, you have to think, you have to be intentional about showcasing your accomplishments and taking advantage of the opportunities that you get to interact with people who can help you. And you'll find some of your male peers, watch some of your male peers some of them are really good at this. And so, you know, take your lessons from, I always talk about the guy who knows everybody in the company and kind of knows everything that's going on behind the scenes, but it's because he's playing golf on Saturday, or he's, you know, he's having a cup of coffee with the right person, or, you know, he's got the right people that pull him into meetings that other people don't get pulled into. That is what you want to happen to you in your career if you want to continue to move up. You know, along those same lines, Julie, I, one of the, what I felt at the time was one of the most annoying things that I had to do, because I just felt like I had to do it when I was working in corporate America, was just making the rounds through the office. And annoying because I had more work than I had time to get it done. But I also knew how important it was to have FaceTime. And in this particular office, we were spread out over three different floors of a really large downtown building. And so If I didn't go up to the other two floors, I could go months without seeing any of those folks. I found that even just walking through the hallway and saying hello and stopping in to ask how other people were doing or what projects they were working on, allowing them the opportunity to tell me something that they were in the middle of or that FaceTime would bring you kind of back into the mix a little bit. And full disclosure, I hated it because I didn't have time for it. And I'm so type A that I just wanted to focus on what I wanted to focus on. And I didn't want to go, you know, make chit chat, but sometimes we just have to strategically think through those same things, just like the elevator speech. Jules, you're not wanting to walk through those halls, but that's your minute on the golf course, right? A lot of women, that's your minute on the golf course, or that's your, Hey, I've got the extra ticket to the game. 
One thing that I do think we can utilize though, is our ability to build relationships. If you are getting to know these people, you're taking that few minutes in line for coffee, you're going out to lunch, you can talk about shared interests. I got invited to a lot of dinners because we had some serious dog photo sharing. I had a coworker who hated golf, but talked about it all the time. She got invited to go golfing, hated it. So part of that invite comes from making sure that you're building a relationship, you're understanding what they're into, you know who you're talking about, and then you can say, oh, you have got a cute new puppy? Show me photos. Speaking the language. Right. Absolutely. You know, the other point that I'd like to make is even the word network is a really interesting word because men think about networking as their safety net and women often think about networking as extra work as Julie said. And so if you have that perspective, you know, that no, this is my safety net. This is not additional work. This is the most critical work you do, because those are the people in the relationships that are going to pull you up or get you what you need. It's even how I got my board positions after, you know, I left corporate America. I was qualified, but so are so many people The way I got chosen to be on corporate boards was someone in my network recommended me. And that's the way the business world typically works. Depending on who you talk to, some people will say women have come a long way in this business world in the gender gap. What do you say to that? I don't think we've come nearly far enough. And it's interesting. (laughs) If you look at the statistics, we haven't. Women have stalled at about 20% of leadership positions, and we achieved 20% in 2004. And we've gone between 20 and maybe 30, 20 and 25 more likely, whether it be CEOs, women on boards, women in the C-suite. So we have not gotten even close to parity. And we still have a lot of work to do. And I would say companies still have a lot of work to do to bring people in that are not like them and that use better processes, better selection tools. There's so many studies that show that if you take the bias, the unconscious bias out of decision making, you know, like uh, orchestra performers performing behind a sheet and then, oh my goodness, wow, we have 50-50 orchestra between women and men when before it was like 90-10 or 80-20. But if you can take the unconscious bias out of selection processes, then we'll be much better at achieving an inclusive environment and a diverse workforce. But we still have, we've made some progress. It's on top of people's minds. They want to do well, but we haven't achieved it, my opinion. How do you think we go about achieving it? Do you think it's following a California steps where they put together a law that says at least one woman has to be on boards for companies? Do you think it is in internal diversity programs? Is it in women need to be putting their hand back and bring another woman with them? How do we focus on bringing more women into leadership and bringing more women into the workforce? I think it's all of the above. There is no magic bullet. If it was easier, if there was a magic bullet, we would have done it. You know, companies like the company that I grew up in, they've been working on it for 40 years. Yet some companies that started working on it five years ago have about the same amount of representation. So it's interesting to me having, you know, been in it for 40 years, kind of looking around and seeing how challenging it actually is. So I think you need to do all of the above. Boards and companies need to be proactive about interviewing people who don't fit kind of their traditional criteria and bringing more women, more women of color, more men of color into organizations. Women need to raise their hand. We need to kind of get educated. We need good social safety nets around us so that it's easier for us to manage home and business. I mean, women that have gone through this pandemic, my heart goes out to managing a family, managing kids at home, managing a career. It's tough. So I think we need to do all of the above to really achieve gender parity. And I'm part of a movement, an organization called Paradigm for Parity, that we've kind of identified some things that we think are really important that companies need to do. And a lot of them we've talked about today. You need to have sponsors as well as mentors. You need to put women in line roles versus staff roles. You need to measure and you need to be transparent about that measurement. You need to offer flexibility so that women can manage both family and home, and you need to manage unconscious bias. 
We try to share best practices among companies that are working on these things so that we can all get better together. And we have over 120 some companies that have signed the pledge to achieve gender parity by 2030 and that are working very hard on it. Isn't it interesting? Because it also seems like for men, we need to tell men, stop looking for what looks like you. But for Mm -hmm. women, we kind of need to tell women, start looking for people who look like you. You know, as women, we do need to help each other. We we need to reach back and we need to mentor each other, sponsor each other. That's why I say that's why I'm so passionate about helping women be successful. If I can, I do. And sometimes women feel they're in competition for roles. And men in companies make us feel that way. I mean, we just don't kind of make that up. You know, I remember once in my career, they said two women got a promotion the same day and they're like, oh, it's women promotion day. You know, that makes you feel great, right? It's like, no, I earned this promotion. And it's unfortunate there are only two of us in the whole company, but you know, finally we both got promoted. We have to reach back and help and mentor each other. And when we get to positions of leadership, we need to represent women. We need to be the courageous voice sometime as leaders, because it's not always easy to be the courageous voice, but we have to think about how to do it. So it's accepted, but we do need to do it. Julie, this might seem like a really odd question, but I've actually been asked it. And so I want to ask it to you. Why is it important to invest in women? Well, I think it's important to invest in women because they're 50% plus of your labor force, of your talent, of your brains, of your energy. I mean, I often say, Can you think of us lobbying off half of the world's population and say, nope, we don't care about Asia. There's 50% of the population that we're not going to learn from. We're not going to be interested in their culture. We're not, you know, we're not going to use them. But why would you take 50% of your workforce and not use them fully and bring, you know, yin and yang, I think is a, a great saying. I mean, we are different. And with that difference, we bring strengths. And women have different strengths that we bring to the workforce that the workforce needs. So we have a lot of lot to offer and we shouldn't be walking by all that talent because it's expensive to hire people. It's expensive to keep people. So let's keep the good people that we get. Perspectives matter so much. I always find it so interesting how people don't understand the importance of the perspective of the other person. How did you get to that? Well, I was going down this trail of thought and this is where it took me. I didn't even think about that. That's the point. (laughs) Exactly. That's exactly the point. We are different. We're equal in our value of who we are and what we bring to the table, but we are completely different in how, in general, and how we see things, how we process things, how we come up with ideas. And that is a good thing. And you Mm -hmm. need that yin and yang to bring together the whole. I don't understand why that's so hard to understand. (laughs) Everything that makes us different makes us stronger. Absolutely. That these are these are strengths that seeing different characteristics, should, we shouldn't be seeing them or, or labeling them as weak. It's it's a strength to be able to pair them together. Julie, thank you so much for joining the Think Take of Three. Before we go, we are collecting advice from successful women in our communities and sharing it out with our forum. So three rapid fire questions for you. Number one, is there a lesson that you've recently learned that you wish you had learned earlier in your career? Well, I think the lesson goes along a lot with what we've talked about today, which is figure out your worth and then ask for it. Figure out what what you want and then ask for it. Be able to speak the language of benefit to the company or benefit to the organization so that you can represent yourself well. What's one piece of advice that you would offer to any woman in business or out of business? You are capable, you're talented, you're smart, you deliver for your company and make sure you end up with a company that delivers for you. You know, if you can find the intersection of what you're really good at and what you're passionate about, you'll be very successful in your career. That's awesome. What is the most important skill for a woman to have? I think it's the ability to build a network. You know, we talked about having that safety net to help you or those people that will pull you through your career or through life or through whatever opportunity that you want. So taking the time to build the relationships in and outside of work will really serve you well in whatever you want to do in life. You can connect with Julie Fazone Holder at jfhinsights.com and we'll share her contact information for you on our website along with this podcast. Julie, thank you again so much for being here today. 
I loved it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure meeting the three of you and I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks, Julie. And that is all for this episode of Think Tank of Three. If you have topics you'd like us to cover or guests you'd like to hear from, send us a message at thinktankofthree at gmail.com. Subscribe to the Think Tank of Three wherever you listen to podcasts and connect with us online. We blog weekly at thinktankofthree.com. Follow us on social media. You can find us individually on LinkedIn and as Think Tank of Three on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Women, click to join our private group on Facebook where we can all share advice and articles. And if you liked what you heard in the podcast, share it. You can find Think Tank of Three on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, Amazon Music, and SoundCloud.